Uh, welcome to the, the very last panel of this conference, everyone. Um, so this is a panel on writing and identity. Uh, and the two is Catherine uh, McDonald, who's a lecturer in classics and ancient history at the University of Exeter. And she's going to talk about creativity uh, and competition, alphabets and identities in Italy. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, and I want to start by saying thank you to the organisers for inviting me. I think it's probably the quickest I've ever replied yes to a conference invitation. Um, and I was right to do so. Thank you to all the um, uh, speakers so far. I feel like I've learned a huge amount in, uh, in two and a half days already. So what I would like to talk about today is um, work in progress as part of my connectivity and competition project. Um, this project looks at how language and writing are used as part of elite display and uh, as expressions of corporate identity and power in Italy in the first millennium BC. Um, and it's designed to be a comparative project looking at um, various different regions of Italy. What I want to talk about today is the role of script in particular in this process. So uh, you have to forgive me the very broad brushstrokes uh, Wikipedia map of the languages of Italy. This gives you a broad idea of the kind of linguistic diversity that we're talking about. And as many of you know, there are also many different alphabets used in Italy during the first millennium BC. Uh, this is my uh, very basic um, uh, kind of demonstration of that, just to give you uh, some idea just using, just using the letter A or alpha, give you a vague sense of the um, numbers of different writing systems that we're talking about. Some of them were very local, uh, others were used over very wide regions. Uh, some writing systems were only used to write one specific language, and others were used to write several different languages, sometimes quite unrelated languages. So the questions for today are, uh, does script have any role in how elites express themselves, uh, in how they show their differences from their neighbours, and um, conversely, their connections with the wider world? The original impetus for uh, my paper came from uh, a 2010 article by Nino Maragi, whose arguments I'll outline uh, briefly. I recommend reading the whole article, it's a very interesting uh, set of arguments. I don't know whether everyone will agree with him, but it's certainly um, an article to be aware of. Uh, and this uh, quotation kind of sums up his argument as a whole. Uh, the Greek local alphabets were not the product of chance, but an instrument that communities of Greeks consciously employed to mark their borders from one another, and to contribute to the creation of a sense of their identity within the broader community of the Greeks. And I've added the emphasis there. Uh, so Laraki's work is about the Greek alphabets uh, specifically, and looking mainly at, uh, at mainland Greece, but also uh, some of the Greek islands as well. And as Laraki notes, it's very widely known that in archaic and early classical Greece, there are many different Greek alphabets. Uh, many of you have seen, have seen tables much larger than this along the same lines, that give a kind of sense of uh, the diversity of alphabets that were employed. And these uh, Greek alphabets are noticeably different from each other, but not normally to the point of being unrecognisable. And that's quite an important point. <coughs> They're all based on the same underlying system uh, with various uh, kind of uh, differences in letter shapes and some differences in what, uh, what letters were included, but the, uh, the underlying uh, system and structure behind them is the same. But they're also so distinctive that uh, if we find an inscription in isolation, we can usually assign any given inscription to a certain region, or actually quite commonly to a certain polis, if it contains certain diagnostic letters. And we'll come back to this idea of diagnostic letters perhaps in a bit. Um, and Laraki notes that Jeffrey's uh, classic work, The Local Scripts of Archaic Greece, gives three potential reasons for this kind of pattern, set of, pattern of differences. Firstly, mistakes in transmission, imagining perhaps that a single person or a small group of people might be responsible for the introduction of the alphabet to a polis and any errors that he or she made would then be incorporated into the official alphabet of the city over time. Secondly, phonetic differences between dialects, so uh, the choice of letter shapes being different, perhaps the choice of what letters are included being different, particularly in the choice of either sigma or san from the original model alphabet as the main sibilant sign, this may be motivated by phonetic differences. And thirdly, uh, deliberate changes to disambiguate similar letters from each other. So if you end up with two characters that are quite similar looking, an individual city might kind of um, make their letters a bit, uh, two characters a bit different from each other, and another city might not do that, or might do it in a different way. 
<coughs> However, the Rocky notes that these potential reasons do not quite sufficiently um, explain the variation in alphabets that we see in Greece, and he particularly draws on the example of Corinth and uh, the neighbouring cities around it. Um, if we look at Corinth and its neighbours, uh, they're all characterised as having a blue alphabet. Um, if people from outside this particular field haven't come across this before, the colours on the map are just a way of um, grouping the Greek, Greek alphabets by the nature of the supplemental signs that are added on to the basic uh, signs of the Greek alphabet. Um, the supplemental signs are actually not what we're talking about today, so in a way the colours um, are not directly relevant. But the main point is that the overall structure of all those dark blue alphabets is basically the same. They basically have all the same letters, but what they don't have is all the same letter shapes. And Corinth is a particularly extreme example of this. Um, forgive my, like, hand drawing very quickly of the characters to give you an idea, but you'll immediately see, for example, that the Corinthian beta is unlike any other beta that you've ever seen in your life, <laughs> and similarly the Corinthian epsilon, the fifth letter there, is very similar to what we might expect a beta to look like in other Greek alphabets, and so on. Um, and these are you know, a group of cities that are very close to each other, uh, with very, very distinctive letter shapes. Um, and these can't arise solely as the result of mistakes in transmission, he argues, because they seem to know that they are distinctive, and they share awareness of the other alphabets around them. Um, so for example, that very distinctive Corinthian epsilon changes shape over time to parallel the development of beta in other alphabets. So they're fully aware that their epsilon is somebody else's beta, and they change the shape along with how the people change their beta. Um, in any case, the cities are so close that the idea of there being a point of transmission and then everyone goes their separate ways with their separate alphabets um, is uh, not kind of believable. Um, in any case, there has to be kind of close contact between the alphabets. And Lauragi goes on to compare uh, Corinth and its neighbours to uh, the rest of the Peloponnese, where the alphabets are much, much more similar to each other. In this case, they're all red alphabets, as I said, that doesn't really matter. Um, but they don't have uh, very clear diagnostic letters that make clear differences between all the different alphabets. Uh, so what's the difference between the area around Corinth and kind of the rest of the Peloponnese? Well, in the area around Corinth, the cities share a very, very similar dialect of Greek. Um, some, in some cases, almost identical. Um, and what's different about them is their alphabet. But in the rest of the Peloponnese, there's a very wide range of dialects uh, which are very distinctive and different. So Arcadian, in particular, being the you know, the go-to example of a Greek dialect that is kind of incomprehensibly different in its phonology, morphology, and so on, to the uh, dialects that are around it. So the argument runs, cities differentiate themselves using their writing, either using their dialect, or if their dialect is not distinctive enough to differentiate them easily from their neighbours, then they deliberately develop an alphabet with characteristic letter shapes, even though the underlying system of the alphabet is the same. So returning to that idea of diagnostic letters, they're not just diagnostic for epigraphers, but they're diagnostic for their original audiences as well. You spot a Corinthian beta and you know exactly what you're looking at. Now this might not seem so important uh, when we're just in the polis itself, because of course if I'm in Corinth, then I know I'm in Corinth. Um, but the significance is more obvious if we think about uh, the use of writing at sanctuaries with many dedications given by many different states and people. Um, so pan-Hellenic sanctuaries, for example, are a good example of where um, the visual appearance of the script of a text might uh, be considered very important. Um, I'm now imagining someone turning up in Corinth and not being sure where they are and just looking at the beaters to check where they might be, uh, which is a nice idea too. But anyway, so uh, these kind of sites where we get uh, inscriptions by people of uh, lots of different areas might be one of the places where these distinctive differences really come into their own. There are also dialect by version texts um, that we might even think of in some cases as by alphabetic texts. So the most famous of these is perhaps uh, this, which is uh, the uh, Phanodikos Stili, um, where the text is in Attic and Ionic, very similar dialects of Greek, uh, but what is immediately the visual difference between them is the two scripts. Um, so perhaps the two um, dialect versions are important, but maybe the two versions of the script are even more important. Um, so some of these um, kind of 
by versions are on stone and official texts, uh, you know, quite formal texts like this one, but there are also graffiti examples on ceramics, for example, where someone has written their name in two different uh, scripts um, and not really in two different dialects. So for the rest of this paper, what I'm interested in exploring is how well this model <coughs> that Laraki argues for um, so convincingly, I think, for, uh, for Greece, transfers to the alphabets of Italy. Does it help us explain anything about what is going on? Were alphabets used to express the borders between political units, such as city-states, <coughs> and were distinctive alphabets more likely to be used where neighbouring cities used, used very different, but, uh, excuse me, were distinctive alphabets more likely to be used where neighbouring cities were using very similar dialects of the same language? So the first area I'd like to look at is uh, Veneto. Um, the Veneto is a region where we have three or two particularly large, important and wealthy cities and then a kind of a third one as well. Uh, so Padua and Este were the two very large and important <coughs> sites of uh, the Veneto. Padua obviously still very large and important, Este now very tiny. Um, and also Vicenza is, is quite nearby as well. And these three cities are uh, not very far apart from each other. They're about 35 kilometers away from each other. Um, so within you know, a reasonable longish walking distance. And what we see at uh, Este and Padua in particular is that they are speaking very, very similar dialects of the language phonetic, as far as we can tell. Um, this is the point at which I have to say, of course, uh, Evidence is nothing like as good as the evidence that we have for Greek dialects on the Greek mainland. But as far as we can see, um, the dialects of phonetic are extremely similar. They use all the same kind of formulae in their inscriptions. They have very similar types of names. There's nothing really that stands out as any uh, major dialectal difference. But what they do have is um, an alphabet that does have these clearly diagnostic letters. And like the Greek alphabets that Laragi describes, the overall alphabet, the system of the alphabet, and what all the you know, letters and sounds that are represented are basically the same, uh, but we just have letter shapes that are very distinctive. So, um, <coughs> again, just sketched out by me there. The very diagnostic letters um, in the phonetic alphabet, uh, a few, there's a few different ones, but the clearest example is the signs for T and D. So, um, in S day we have uh, the T is a cross shape, and the D is actually derived um, originally from the Etruscan letter Z, which is why it has this uh, particular form. In Vicenza, they share a letter T, but they have um, a different sign for D, so uh, derived from um, what we think of as a T shaped letter. Um, but in Padua, we have something very different. So the, um, the cross shape you get in Exeter um, in Este, sorry. <laughs> The end of term, and they're trying to pull me back in. Um, so the T shape that you get in S day, um, in Padua is used for the D instead. So um, both the dialects have both these phonemes, but the sign has, uh, has been uh, used for different ones. And what you get in Padua instead for the uh, the T phoneme is you get this theta, which is actually um, a dead letter at Este, it's not used at all. It's used uh, in Absidaria, but it doesn't occur in any inscriptions at all. So if you saw that letter, and you will see some examples, if you saw that letter, uh, you would know immediately that this is not uh, an inscription that's using the normal alphabet of Este. Um, and this is an interesting kind of um, distinction that there's the different... Um, alphabets in the sense of different letter shapes, though um, following <coughs> the same underlying system, because something quite parallel happens in other areas of um, Venetic epigraphy as well. So for example, if we look at the funerary epigraphy, what you see on the left there is a series of examples of um, uh, funerary uh, stele uh, from Este, and on the right is you uh, see one from Padre. And these are all very kind of typical shapes. Um, so the ones in Este are uh, tall and tapering, and the writing goes up uh, the, uh, the front of the, uh, the monument. Um, there are different sizes, but basically all very similar shapes. Whereas the ones in Padua, 
are more highly decorated. They tend to be rectangular in shape. They have a central uh, field uh, with an image, often um, of horses or chariots or something like that. And the inscription can go around the edge of the image, or it can be underneath. And so <coughs> that one actually has a has a Latin inscription added underneath, but it gives you the kind of general idea of the shape. And these shapes of monuments uh, endure for a very long time, and they're very distinctively different on first sight. But they do actually form the same basic function. The overall structure of how people are buried, um, the overall system of how people are buried, is very similar. In that these monuments don't mark individual graves; they mark groups of family. Um, burials, uh, normally uh, small groups of cremation burials, um, and uh, although the um, monuments tend to only uh, actually name a single person or sometimes a couple. So the purpose of them and the text of them is very, very similar, but the visual appearance is different. And I think we can argue that something similar is going on with the alphabet. Um, there are actually a few um, inscriptions that have been classed by modern epigraphers as Paduan inscriptions that are um, present in Este. So uh, you can probably just about see this theta character here um, for the name uh, Ituria. And this is kind of an interesting combination of influences because it is found at Este. It has a shape that is not quite like a typical uh, shape of an SA monument, but it is also not a typical shape of a Paduan monument either. Um, but it has normally been understood as someone who is from Padua because of the use of this theta um, for the phoneme T. Um, even uh, stranger, perhaps, is when we get it in, um, not just in names, where we can think, well, we don't know the exact chronology of the names, but when we get it in, um, in that school words. So this is uh, one of the dedications to uh, the goddess Ratia. This is a large sanctuary in Este, and she's a goddess of writing, uh, our patron goddess for the day, perhaps. And um, she accepts donations of many kind, uh, and these are dedicated uh, styluses that have been inscribed. And what we see here is the formula is exactly the same as the formulae that we get in all the others, but the alphabet is the alphabet used in Padua. And you can see this in the name, but you might be able to uh, particularly see that word donasta that starts with a cross-shaped character. So it starts with the, what in um, uh, in essay would be uh, the T is used for a D, and the second to last letter you might be able to see is the theta character before that final O. So is this perhaps evidence of someone coming from uh, another city and dedicating something in the mode of the local dedications, but using their own alphabet. Um, this is what it's generally uh, seen to be. So, although the evidence that we have is much, much more meagre, um, it does seem that for an area like the Veneto, where we have large, uh, important um, urban sites with, uh, you know, particularly with large sanctuaries that might be visited uh, by various different people. This, uh, this model of uh, differentiating yourself from your very similar neighbour using your alphabet uh, does seem to uh, ring true, in, uh, at least as a way of um, guessing at why these uh, distinctive diagnostic letters appeared in the first place and why they're maintained <coughs> over such a long time. I now like to look at a different area, so the Bay of Naples, um, turning to uh, something a little bit different, um, which is to uh, look at some of the uh, very random and unusual uh, alphabets in Italy, and uh, does this model of deliberate difference uh, actually help us to understand why we have these very unusual, uh, very localised alphabets. So if you look at the Bay of Naples, um, if we're thinking out of 6th century BC, 5th century BC, what we've got is an area that is very much dominated by, um, by Greek-speaking, uh, settlements and also by Etruscan speaking settlements. So um, the Greek settlements of um, Pithecusae and Cumae and Naples, um, I guess Pompeii is using uh, Greek then as well, and then the um, Etruscan sites like Capua and uh, some Etruscan sites slightly further north as well. Um, but what we have at the edge of that is, uh, is Nocera, and in Nocera we have this. Um, <coughs> 
very weird looking alphabet that's only tested, I think, in about four or five inscriptions and only for you know, a century or so. Um, and just to highlight some of the, what we might call the most diagnostic letters, um, some, because some things, you know, like the alpha just looks like a rotated alpha, that's not a big deal. Um, but um, the, the new, the N character is very strange. This very nice F is a kind of modified digamma. We get the digamma as well, um, but we also have a modified version for F. Um, and these uh, kind of sibilant signs, which um, I don't know exactly what's going on with them. They, I mean, there's, there's other things that are similar, but there's no alphabet that in its entirety looks exactly like this. Um, and it has been suggested that, again, this is um, a, uh, a deliberate move to look very visually different from uh, very powerful, very nearby uh, neighbours. Um, in this case, actually speaking uh, different languages. So the language of Natera <coughs> is not Oscan, but it's some kind of relate language related to Oscan. It's some kind of Sabellic language. Um, it's probably a bit early for Oscan as, as we know it. Um, and this is, uh, you know, part of um, what people have argued for this alphabet for. So Daniele Maras has said the creation of such a local alphabet depended on the will of the Ausonian people, which means the people of Natera, to distinguish themselves from both the Etruscans and the Greeks with whom they shared the region. Once again, writing was a marker of ethnic identity. Um, I think I'd tweak that a little bit and say not necessarily ethnic identity, but certainly kind of civic um, identity and kind of emphasising that they are a little bit different on the edge of this region. The Bay of Naples is interesting because the Machera alphabet then um, is not used anymore, it dies out. Um, there's a lot of linguistic change in the Bay of Naples. We get a lot of uh, both Greek and Etruscan sites eventually uh, switching their language to Oscan and then to Latin and so on. So as that kind of happens, perhaps language rather than script becomes the thing that is the most notable, notable difference uh, between all the sites uh, and the more kind of salient thing that people notice, um, particularly if you think of somewhere like Naples where being Greek, speaking Greek is absolutely their, their hallmark uh, that they kind of uh, trade on. But in this uh, earlier period, it's interesting to think of the appearance of the Nocheran alphabet as something that um, is meant to be distinctive. So it's not just us looking at going, that looks very strange and unusual, um, but it is actually meant to make a thing. Uh, my next example of a weird alphabet is one I only was introduced to about two weeks ago, so I am afraid, uh, con context-wise, I am uh, not very up on the details, but this is from uh, Voltino, uh, which is up uh, right in, in the north of Italy, as you can see, in quite a um, mountainous region north of Verona, so actually not a million miles away from uh, Padua and Este and Vicenza that we were talking about before. Um, and this is a photograph uh, that mixer of this uh, department sent me a couple of weeks ago from his holidays, and um, uh, this is um, well. There's a lot of interesting stuff here. So, so there's a Latin text, right, of some description, but we also have in the fourth line of the Latin text we have this other character that has made it into the Latin text. Um, this character does make it into some other. Um, uh, Latin inscriptions, so that's not completely out of character for the region that we have a few um, characters in personal names that are uh, representing phonemes who don't get in Latin, so we need to use them in our Latin names, that's fair enough. Um, what is particularly strange about it is the two lines of text underneath, which um, people have tried and tried to uh, categorise. I've kind of given the interpretations given by Esker and Wallace as a kind of best guess scenario, and they very much present it like that. Um, the problem is if you try and make it a um, a by version with the Latin text, it's really hard to get a good match um, on the names that people have tried. Um, and what we end up with is uh, the only way people can make sense of it is kind of saying, well, it seems like they've borrowed letters from lots of different uh, alphabets that are used to write completely unrelated languages. Um, <coughs> the language of this text is not completely understood. Some people say communic or whatever, but then what is communic? That's the next question. So um, it's not really clear why they have this very individual alphabet that's really only found, again, in a handful of inscriptions, three or four inscriptions. Yeah. So um, 
And we have you know things that are borrowed. It looks like letter shapes borrowed from um, from the Roman alphabet, from the phonetic alphabet. We don't know the values of all of them. You know, is this third one down? Is it a sigma um, or not? We don't know. Um, um, so again, we have this very individual, unusual alphabet. Um, at this point, I have more questions about this than answers, but um, it's interesting to think that maybe it was perhaps meant to be distinctive. However, we're in a very different kind of region here without um, you know, closely packed kind of urban sites, so it's not necessarily anything like the same um, uh, context as we get in the Veneto. Lastly, to just talk about something very different, look at the Oscan alphabet. So Oscan is a language that's spoken quite widely in Italy, <coughs> and it's written in three uh, main different alphabets. So uh, what's sometimes called the Oscan alphabet, or central Oscan alphabet, or the native alphabet, the national alphabet. I'll just call it the Oscan alphabet for simplicity's sake. It's also written in an adaptation of the Greek alphabet, which is the Greek alphabet with some extra characters um, for sounds that we don't have in Greek, like F. <coughs> And it's, of course, also written in the Latin alphabet. So what I was interested in thinking about is if a lot of people in the same region are all using Oscan and therefore all using very similar um, language, similar dialects, are there areas where they're differentiating themselves by script, um, specifically? Um, if we look at the 4th century, 4th um, and 3rd century, um, the... Um, you can see this is quite regional, so we have the Latin alphabet in the furthest area north, Oscan alphabet kind of in the middle, and the Greek alphabet in those areas which are towards the south and the most closely in contact with uh, Greek settlements in the south of Italy. Um, there's nothing that looks particularly isolated. That one, that one dot up the top is, um, is like a slingshot bullet or something, so that's to do with a war that they had somewhere else. Um, <laughs> but no, otherwise, people, uh, it doesn't look that isolated. Um, I will zoom in in a minute, but if we look in the Later on, in the second and first centuries BC, you can see the use of the Greek alphabet is kind of waning a little bit for Oscan. We're getting more stuff in the Latin alphabet further south. So let's zoom in on those uses of the Latin alphabet right down in the south. Um, so what we have here um, is one city that's kind of quite isolated, which is Vantia. Uh, the other orange dot is just one graffito. Um, so Vantia quite isolated in the south in its use of the Latin alphabet. What it uses it for is various things, various <coughs> religious type inscriptions, um, but also the Tabula Vantina, which is a very famous, very long legal text in Oscan. So it's not like these are just graffiti. These are, you know, official texts written and commissioned by um, the city itself. So that little dot in Vantia is looking a little bit isolated there. Um, but of course, there's more to this story than I'm giving away, perhaps, if we just look at a map <coughs> of uh, the alphabets used to write Oscan. So although Venusia there is a blue dot because we do have Oscan written in the, the Oscan alphabet <coughs> there, it is actually a Roman colony, it's a Roman site, and so there's plenty of Latin speakers there, people using the Latin alphabet. So although Bantia looks very isolated in terms of its relationship with other users of the same language, it looks like it's using quite a different script to its neighbours. What it's perhaps doing is using the script of a powerful neighbour who speak a different language. Right. So uh, aligning themselves uh, with Rome somewhat, although keeping their own language and their own legal system and so on. Um, so there's a story that goes beyond just differentiating from their neighbours who speak a similar language. They are also looking towards another set of neighbours. Right. So not just about differentiation, but about making connections as well. We also have to keep in mind that, again, this is not an area of a lot of big um, populous sites. Um, some of these have a lot of inscriptions, but something like Rosano di Valio is a big sanctuary site, you know, it's not a habitation site. Um, so Venice is a <laughs> decent size, Bantia is a decent size, uh, Tegiano is a decent size, but these are not, um, you know, tightly packed uh, urban spaces in the same way that parts of the Veneto or the Bay of Naples are. So the story is quite different, um, but I think it's still an interesting tool to think with if we take uh, the differentiation idea as a kind of um, hypothesis and see are there other factors that might be at play. So to conclude, um, are there any, ideas, any areas where this model might help us? 
Uh, well, I think the Ravis model has a lot to tell us about the development of alphabets in archaic Greece, absolutely. I also think that the similarities between Greece and Italy should not be underestimated, particularly in areas with multiple neighbouring independent cities, such as the Veneto and Bay of Naples. <coughs> it's very appealing to see both language and alphabet as part of the elite's creation of a corporate identity, and particularly somewhere like the Veneto, where language itself is not really a differentiating factor. But in areas um, which were more sparsely populated, where urban sites uh, were not organised in quite the same way, or sites were more spread out, uh, there's less reason to think that alphabets had this role. But I still think it's a very interesting working hypothesis to then add other evidence and uh, other points of view to as well. Thanks very much. Cool.